Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Galloway, and I'm here with my co-author, Terry Mathis. Say hi, Terry. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We wanted to provide this webinar to outline what's in our 2013 best-selling book, Steps to Safety Culture Excellence. Our consulting firm was founded in 1993, and since then, we've been working exclusively on the excellence aspects around safety performance and safety culture. So when we were contacted in 2011 to write this book, the proposal essentially said there's a lot of book, there, books, there's a lot of content around describing what a safety culture is, but nobody really had anything that was in the public domain that stated and described step by step precisely how do you create a culture of safety excellence. Thus, the book Steps to Safety Culture Excellence was published in 2013. Many organizations around the world are using this book to help them develop their own strategy and execute against not only how do they achieve excellence in safety performance, but also their sustainability mechanism, their culture. So that's what we were tasked to do. So we wrote this book. We've had a lot of organizations come back and they had some, some questions around some of the methodologies and some of the models. So we thought it would be a, a good opportunity to share some of these more visually in a webinar. And that's what you're having here today. Yeah, this uh, idea that uh, you'd like to improve your safety culture is not a new idea. It's one that's been around for a long time. But one of the things that we found as consultants is that a lot of people try to do too much at once. They try to do everything at once. And in fact, some of the books that we read when we were getting ready to write this book suggested that you do everything at once and talked about what a massive job it was and how many years it was going to take and everything to uh, to improve your safety culture. Seven to ten years, right? <laughs> Seven to ten years right. to completely yeah. change your culture. Well, you know, and part of their, their point was valid. You know, it, it, your culture for over a long period of time. You're not going to change it overnight. But the, the thing is, you don't have to change your whole culture. In fact, you don't want to change your whole culture. There are only some strategic targets that you want to go for to uh, build that commonality in your culture. One of the other mistakes that we found a lot of people making was that they wanted to assess their starting point and then develop a strategy. And as consultants, and, and having done many, many of these things, we have realized over the, that period of time that that's backwards. You need your strategy first. If, if not, your, your assessment is simply going to be a gap uh, analysis, and your, your strategy is simply going to be a gap filler. You, you want to back up and say, okay, what does success look like? And you want to picture that and target that and then say, okay, now where are we in relation to that ideal that we'd really like to go for? Terry, one of the things that I heard you say many years ago that I, I know we, we leverage in a lot of our keynotes and everything is that when you look at what culture is, there's a lot of complex definitions of culture. Culture really is what's common. And I like how you, you kind of came up with that. Culture is what's common. And one of the things that's critical that you start with here with the strategy, which strategy begins as a hypothesis. Where do we think we can add sustainable value over a period of time? What choices, trade-offs are we going to make? What are we going to do and what are we not going to do? But it begins with identifying what would be the new common. If we had excellence in our culture, excellence in safety performance, what would be common? What would people know? What would they believe? What stories would be common? What beliefs would be common? What behaviors, competencies would be common? If you don't define what's desirable and what you're going after and what that new common reality would be, then like you're saying, Terry, you do an assessment. It's a gap closing exercise against many different perspectives on what the starting point is. And we've talked about this in other webinars, Terry, but when the leadership team of an organization isn't on the same page of how we define excellence and safety, how we're going to get there, who's responsible for it, and the time and resources necessary, we all go in so many different directions. This is why we, when we wrote about this in the book, it was based on our change in methodology many years ago as well, that we started realizing we have to define that end in mind first, and then we assess against our strategic choices. Now, all strategies you execute against it, you're going to realize that you didn't have all the information that you need. So no strategy is perfectly designed in the beginning, but you assess against that starting point, and then you start looking at 
where do we really need to get everybody on the same page, on the same sheet of music? Exactly. That's this clarity step that, that's next in this one. Everybody has to have the same roadmap to the same location. And if you're going to align that effort, that's exactly what has to happen and doesn't happen in so many organizations. But then you get to these next two, the climate and the chemistry. These are the two handles on culture. You don't really, culture is really a byproduct. It's really the result of the controlling of, of climate and chemistry and getting into control of, of uh, what, where you want your culture to go. You know, that's a good point. Perceptions are a byproduct. Behaviors are a byproduct. If you don't understand what experiences are driving the perceptions, you can't change perceptions just by targeting them. You, ch you change perceptions by targeting the information or experiences that drive them, just like behaviors. You can't change behaviors by targeting behaviors. You have to identify and address the influences on behavior. It's the same with culture. You have to look at the you have to look at the climate and the chemistry. You know, think of a growing plant. You can't manage the seed to grow. You manage the environment, the conducive environment. You have to have the right chemistry. You have to have the right climate. You have to have the right conditions. We find that that's critical to this thinking. Also, you've got to think of culture as an organic thing, not a construct that you put together. There's one other level of complexity too, and this looks like a lot more than one other level of complexity, but you've got to realize that your culture is not all the same. Not everybody in your organization is exactly in the same boat. You've got people who just got there. You've got people who have been there for many, many years. You've got people who came in in the middle. Uh, you've got some very experienced people that you hired. You've got some inexperienced people that you hired. Uh, you know. I, a lot of people say, well, a, a cult, our, our, our organization is a big box and there's a bunch of dots in it and those are the people. No, it's a pipeline. These people aren't just sitting there in your box. They're going through your pipeline. And this pipeline is the tenure of, of, uh, of your workforce. You know, the, the people who just got there, the people who have been there a while, the people who came in uh, later. You've got to realize that you've got different groups, different subcultures, and this is one of the things that complicates it a little bit. You can't think of everybody exactly the same way. So once you've got this reality in your mind that, first of all, as we just pointed out, you're going to have to, to improve your culture a step at a time, and secondly, that it's not just one culture. It's a bunch of subcultures put together. Then you can move on to the next step. You know, and when you talk about the different cultures, safety is an aspect of occupational or organizational culture. Theoretically, there's no such thing as a safety culture, and you don't want to necessarily pull it off to the side as something which to manage. I've yet to find an organization that is excellent in communication in all aspects of operations, but just not so in safety. Usually, they're universal challenges or opportunities, but sometimes it is important to use language to get everybody to agree on certain things so we understand what we mean. Just like when we talk in the book about how we define safety, how we define excellence in safety, those things are critical. So we use the term safety culture just to give it bookends, just so we have some common themes and some common understanding to manage with them. But the most positive feedback we get about this book and all of our methodologies really is that you could directly apply this to all areas of occupational culture. Safety just happens to be something Terry and I are very passionate about. But one of the things that a lot of organizations have done, and you know, we've said this too, you could go back and find some videos where Terry and I are speaking and we say this, you have to integrate safety into all aspect of occupational, of all of operational activities. It has to be the way well, you could actually go too far with that sometimes. You end up disengaging people. You have to have a strategy. Imagine a business strategy in the marketplace, and their business strategy was focusing on just failing fewer customers. That wouldn't be a very successful business strategy. Yet when we look at how we typically manage safety strategically, there's a four-step process that Terry and I have discovered that tends to be the most common safety strategy. Number one, they review their incident rate. They look at their incident rate. Number two, they set a new incident rate goal or objective. Number three, they develop a list of things to do, initiatives, programs to implement. Number four, they act on that. And then they're back to how did we do? Now, the problem with that is we all know to avoid that dangerous correlation causation trap, yet we fall precisely in it when we've done some things, we've had improved performance, therefore we've had improved performance because we were doing these things. 
Not necessarily. Sometimes it was normal variation. Sometimes you were successful in spite of the things that you were doing. So we have to look at this and say, what's the business strategy? Just like from a, from a public company has a goal to increase market capitalization or increase their market share, strategy is a framework of choices. It's trade-offs. It's small bets that we make to determine how to capture and deliver value. Strategy is how do we win. So when we look at some of the elements necessary for strategy, you have to have a stated purpose. Why are we doing this? What's the narrative? What's the rationale? What's the reason? Why should other people be excited about this? We're not just talking about a strategy for basics, by the way. There's things you have to do to remain employed and to operate in certain areas. What we're talking about is excellence. We're talking about discretionary effort. You have to get people engaged in this. We're also talking about getting out of reactive management, and that's one of the things that we find so many organizations trapped in. And it's not only in safety, it's in a lot of other aspects of uh, operational excellence also, that organizations are trying to fail less rather than trying to succeed. And when you come back and define that purpose, that tends to get you out of that fail less mentality and into what does success truly look like. And when we look at, well, what does success look like? A lot of companies will say, well, safety is a value. Unless we have determined what beliefs we're talking about, and which ones we're not, safety, quite frankly, becomes propaganda on posters hung throughout an organization saying safety is a value. What beliefs would be common if safety was a value? What behaviors would you see consistently that tells you safety is a value? So it's important to look at this. Is safety really a core value? Is it a situational value? What's the vision? What does safety excellence look like? Do we all agree? What are the goals, both short-term and long-term? What data do we have to drive our decisions around this, to set the objectives, to determine how to market and get people really engaged in this? Some people have told us you shouldn't have to market safety. You do if you want discretionary effort. Excellence, I've never seen a company punished into excellence, and I've never seen an organization become excellent in safety just by doing the things they have to do. You know, too, when they say you don't have to market safety, they're thinking about safety as a universal uh, construct. No, you don't have to convince people that they don't want to get hurt. What you have to convince people of is that program you put together is actually going to accomplish that goal. Yes, no, they don't want to get hurt, but they're not convinced that your rules and procedures are going to actually help them accomplish that. That's what you got to sell. And there's a lot of great ideas that, that we could leverage from marketing, and we talk about it in the book as well, and a lot of other examples we can provide, but you have to have an approach to this. How are we going to market people on this strategy, get them aligned with this? What initiatives are going to best work with us? What initiatives we're currently doing might we need to stop doing, or what will we not do this year and maybe won't touch for a couple of years? Those are very difficult questions to ask and answer, but that's the point of a strategy. It's a framework of choices. We have to make sure we have accountability. In a lot of organizations, accountability is a bad word because it's used more reactively and negatively. We didn't get the results we wanted. Who needs to be held accountable? We use the term in the book proactive accountability to focus on and highlight it needs to be focus more on performance accountability, not just results accountability, and there needs to be a balance of consequences around that. But culture change, which is what we're talking about here, happens best from within. Who from within are the people that are going to help you grow these ideas, help things become new, become common? What measurements do we have in place that tell us that the things we're doing are adding sustainable value? Yes, we're going to be held accountable for injury rates reducing, but the challenge all of us will face at some point in time in safety is not getting to zero recordables, but knowing precisely how we got there. And the mindset, we can always improve. There will always be a better way, and that's, of course, continuous improvement. But when you look at your existing culture, 
each organization, again, has a culture. People join your company with existing perceptions. Even if your company's brand new, they're, they're, most of them are adults, I would imagine, so they're being hired and they have existing perceptions. That impacts their attitudes and values, shared values, but even personal values. If I believe it's a good idea to stop a job for a safety concern, I'll make a different decision than if I don't believe that. If I believe my direct supervisor supports me doing something in safety, I'll make a different decision than if I don't believe that. When I decide to act on that belief, behave in a certain way, I have an expectation of what will occur. And, and you know, Terry and I recognize that you know, psych in psychology they teach you that all disappointment is based on a set level of expectations. If you've ever been disappointed, it's because your expectations aren't being met. Now, some of this should make sense. We should be able to follow the logic here. Now, here's what happens from a cultural perspective. If I believe, if I have a perception, it's a good idea to stop a job for a safety concern, and I act on that, and I stop the job for a safety concern, if I have a good experience, I don't tell a lot of stories about that because I expected to have a good experience. If I have a great experience, I might tell a couple of people because it exceeded my expectations. I'm pleasantly surprised. If I have a negative experience, well, this is where we realize in culture, the more negative the experience is, the louder the storytelling that either confirms or conflicts with the existing perceptions. We either manage the, the influences on the culture or we will be managed by it. We manage the storytelling or we will be managed by it. Consider in your organization, who has the loudest voice? Those trying to create the better improved reality or those trying to maintain the status quo. And that's why it's important that we first make these choices in the book. What do we want people to believe? What do we want them to do to be able to do? What decisions do we want them to make? What stories would we hear that would be common that tells us we're going in the right direction and our safety strategy is aligning perfectly and helping our business strategy? It's important to make those key choices first, and then you look at your existing culture. The first aspect you look at, of course, is the climate. And this climate, if you control it, is one of the greatest ways to control those perceptions that Sean is talking about. The climate, to a large degree, is how leadership uh, interfaces with the workforce. What is it that connects the leaders with the workers? How is that interface managed, and what is that relationship that's created there? And we have what we call the four C's across here. Is our, our leaders and supervisors perceived to be committed to safety you know uh, a lot of a lot of times they're perceived to give it lip service but not necessarily to really be sincere about what what they're trying to do that they'd like for it to happen but uh, that they're not really personally involved in it also the the caring part of this is, is a tremendous amount uh, Sean's pointed out on a number of occasions that people tend to react emotionally before they react intellectually to a lot of things. So do you really care about safety? Do, is safety about people or is it about numbers? You know, and, and th this caring can be, co can be communicated a number of different ways from leaders and supervisors, but if all they ever talk about are the numbers and the people disappear from it, then safety loses its human face. And when safety doesn't have a human face, it's just got a, a number, a blackboard with numbers, I'm sorry, a whiteboard these days. No, I'm sorry, a computer screen with numbers. <laughs> You're right? dating yourself here. <laughs> oh, my gosh, I'm old. Uh, but the, uh, this, this idea of caring about safety being about people is, is hugely important in creating the kind of culture that you're looking for. Also, is there a sense of cooperation? Are leaders working with the workforce or are they working on the workforce in what they're doing? Is safety a cooperative, collaborative effort or is it a dictatorship in which the leaders say, by gosh, you better not get hurt or you're going to get in trouble? Now, one of the ways that that, that can happen and almost everything can happen good in an organization is this thing called coaching. Coaching is how one person helps another person perform better. And by the way, it's not limited to safety. It's almost every aspect of business. The, one of the things that we've found, and uh, we're going to be talking on this uh, at, at some other conferences that are coming up soon, coaching is the leadership style of excellent organizations because it's, it's the leadership style that is continuously improving and expecting everybody to continuously improve.
So how do your leaders and supervisors interface with your workforce? Is it a, is it a level of commitment, caring, cooperation, and coaching, or is it just command and control? Those are the other two C's that we see a lot of times uh, replacing these four C's across there, and those are the organizations that have trouble and struggle trying to get to that level of excellence. The other aspect to look at here when we're looking at the culture, the climate, and the chemistry, these elements we found when rate high consistently tell us why we have such great results in many of our client organizations. When you look at the different elements here, passion, how would you rate the level of passion in your organization? How many people are passionate about safety excellence, not their own injury-free outcome at the end of the day, but passionate about what it, what it means to achieve and work on safety excellence. What's the level of focus? Focus to us is an acronym, forming one common understanding of safety. Is it laser-like? Is it precise? Could you go up to anybody and ask them what the most important thing to focus on in safety, and they would give you the right answer? Expectations. A lot of people will say, we know it's expected of us. Zero injuries, whether they believe in that or not. No, we're talking about do people know what's expected of them in the quest for safety excellence? Do they know what their individual roles and responsibilities are? Could you go up to any supervisor and ask them, what are your two most important responsibilities, both to help us prevent injuries, but also to shape our safety culture? Would you get the right answer? Proactive accountability. Are we holding people more accountable for their performance, not just the results? Is there a balance of consequence for both of those? Things already get reinforced in the organization. Are the right things being reinforced? What happens in the absence of the enforcers? What happens after orientation, onboarding, induction exercises? Are the right things reinforced? What's your comfort of vulnerability? You know, success often can breed complacency in organizations. Do people maintain a healthy appreciation for the risk? Do they feel that they're still vulnerable? We want people to be happy and excited about the success when they go a long period of time without recordables and lost times and even no injuries. It's dangerous, though, if they think it's never going to happen to them. We know we can't engineer all risks or hazards out of any industrial setting. Do people maintain a healthy appreciation for the risk? How would you rate the vulnerability in your organization? Communication. Are the right things being communicated? Boundaryless, free-flowing. Do we verify messages were received and understood, not just sent? Are we measuring the right things? Are we measuring what we want rather than just what we don't want? When you look at what measurement is supposed to do, it's supposed to prompt, direct, align, and motivate behavior. How many people in the organization are motivated by safety measurements? Why not? Typically because we measure all the things we don't want. We have a lot of accountability systems built around when we don't get what we want here. So it's important that we're measuring the right things. And the bonding agent, the binding agent that makes all of these work individually and collectively is trust. If people don't trust that the passion is real, if they don't trust why we're holding them accountable, if they don't trust what we're focusing on, if they don't trust what we're communicating, none of this is going to work. And as a special offer for those of you watching this webinar here today, Terry and I have developed several exercises that you can take the, the previous model and this one as well and work in collaboration with people in your organization and lead them through an exercise to define what your starting point is and where you're at on both the climate and the chemistry exercise. Terry and I in our consulting engagements and workshops have done this at least a couple of hundred times. Every single time it starts wonderful, insightful dialogue and discussion to help us understand why we have our current realities. Again, everybody has an existing culture. Perceptions, behaviors, they're all byproducts. If we don't know what's creating them, we don't know precisely where the leverage points are to try to help them excel. We talked a little bit already about marketing safety, but marketing has several different aspects to it. I gave a talk at National Safety Council not too long ago about giving safety a brand identity. You know, uh, having it recognized, having spokespeople for it, uh, all the things that branding can do, uh, that, that branding does for other products, wouldn't you like to have that happening for your safety program? Also, it's, it's very powerful. Positioning also, and this isn't just priority 
of safety. This is, uh, this is where is safety in your overall strategy, which goes back to that vision and, and all the other steps that Sean was talking about in developing it. By the way, a, a lot of people say, well, this is what safety is going to be. Have you listened to your customer? You know, almost everybody that brands and markets anything else goes out and listens to their customer and finds out what they need and what they want and what they perceive that they need before they say, you know, here's the product that you need. Now, obviously, there's some things in safety that we can be very innovative, too. Uh, Bill Gates said nobody knew they needed an iPhone until I invented one. I think Steve Jobs said that, too. Yeah, I think he did. You're right. <laughs> yeah, Bill, Bill Gates said, darn Steve, Steve Jobs. He's, he's always beating <laughs> me to these other ideas out there. But, uh, you know, th there are innovative things you can come up with, but there are things that your, that your workers need also. And it's amazing what's happened with a lot of organizations we've worked with when they just ask their workers, what do you need in safety? And they started putting their programs together around that rather than around what they thought they needed, which was sometimes was even more simple. And do, do people feel good? When people go out and do what you ask them to do in safety, what kind of experience do they get? Sean talked about how these experiences reform your perceptions. Uh, you know, what is, what is the real, what gets, what reinforces uh, someone's decision to follow your safety guidelines and follow your safety programs. Do they really feel safer? Do they really feel more a part of the culture? Or do they get beaten up for doing things like that because it takes longer? You know, as we've, we've written this book and, and done a lot of workshops around this, you know, several people within organizations have said, yeah, but we, we have a name and logo. We don't necessarily need a name and logo. Branding is how people associate with a product, a service, a person, a company. That's what branding is. It's not exclusively a name and a logo. It's how somebody associates with something. Your organization, I would bet, has a safety brand. Is it perceived good? Is it perceived negatively? And on the voice of the customer as well, you know, back to how a strategy is really defined, our definition at least, it's a framework of choices to determine how to capture and deliver value. Customers, who are the customers of your safety strategy? Well, there's a lot of people at different points in times. Yes, we could say everybody's a customer, but you know, out in the marketplace as well, if everybody's a customer, then companies tend to fail. So you tend to find your niche. You tend to find your key area. Who's the customer right now? If we're doing things, are we creating value? That's what this is all about. And sometimes the customer is not going to know necessarily what they need or what they want. A lot of organizations, you know, that's why they maintain the phrase better practice rather than best practice because they know we can always be better. We know that we, that there's always a way that we can improve. And that's the part of this continuous improvement is are we marketing in a way to solicit buy-in, to get people engaged in this? And if we're doing things in safety, is it creating the movement both in the hands and feet and hearts and minds? And that's what's really, really important about measuring the right things, not just your lagging indicators and leading indicators. And a phrase that Terry and I coined a couple of years ago, transformational safety indicators, where you measure the most important things and also the contribution of value between activities and results. But the balanced scorecard idea from Kaplan and Norton in the 90s, it's been critical for business objectives. And in safety, Terry, you wrote one of the first pieces on this many years ago, but you have to, you have to look at it from multiple sides. You know, for example, if you're training, let's look at manage, the side of the things we're doing to affect safety. If we're not measuring whether training is changing what people believe or changing what they do, and we're only measuring we did some training, we had improved performance, that's where we sometimes can lull ourselves into a false sense of confidence. We did them some things, that's why we had the results. Sustainability, is it going to sustain? Well, Sean mentioned a little bit earlier that excellence isn't just getting to zero accidents. It's knowing exactly how you got there and how you stayed there, how you get there again year after year. Is if, if you don't know if your training's really contributing to that, or not. If all you know is how many hours you stuck somebody in a in a chair in a classroom, or you know the, some of these other superficial things that we measure from time to time, uh, you don't really understand that, and you don't really know how you can continuously improve it. That's why it's so important. We think, and and, and we applaud companies that are getting out of this one-dimensional thinking that safety is just a recordable rate and a severity rate, into looking for leading indicators. That's two-dimensional thinking. But if you look at this, this is three-dimensional thinking. This is what drives safety. How does what does it really change in in terms of perceptions, culture? 
uh, and everything. How does that impact common practice and how does common practice impact results? Absolutely. Now we've outlined in one of our first steps here, one of the first slides, kind of the key steps of of, of, of our process to safety culture excellence, but each one of these each one of these steps are milestones. So each one of them has a step built within. And what's important is that you don't necessarily follow this milestone one by milestone two. Organizations are going to be at different starting points. And that's why we encouraged in the book to read it all the way through and then come back and look at where you're at and where you could add the most value. And, you know, almost every organization looks at some of these things and says, we already do that. We're, we're already there. We've already, uh, we've already accomplished that. We know that you're not at a zero starting place when you're building your safety culture. You've already got a safety culture. But if you'll back up and look at this step by step, I think you'll find where your uh, additional opportunities for further improvement are. And if you'll do them a, a little at a time, I think you'll find that you're making progress on a daily basis toward your goal of improving your safety culture and can get into this continuous improvement mode over a period of time by following it step by step this way. And we think we really believe, you know, in, in our uh, consulting experience with our clients, these are the major pieces that we have seen make the biggest difference out there for them. So this isn't just theoretical. We didn't sit in an ivory tower somewhere and dream all this stuff up. It all came right out of the field, right out of consulting projects with real clients who have real problems out there in the real world and have solved them by addressing these particular issues. So we hope you, we've been able to provide additional value. We hope you've enjoyed the book. We hope if you've already read it, this gives you some additional insights into it. We, we'd love to continue the discussions outside of this webinar here today. If you'd like to contact us through the different social groups, or if you'd like to speak to Terry or me privately, uh, please contact our firm, and we'd love to carry the conversations forward. We thank you so much for your attention and interest in this topic. It's something Terry and I are very passionate about. We have a couple of more books that are going to be coming out soon, and, of course, we have all our articles, podcasts, videos, blogs. All of those can be accessed on our Insights page. But most importantly, we thank you for your dedication to safety, and we look forward to the opportunity to meet you in person one day.